Hey, Jordan Belfort here, the Wolf of Wall Street in the Wolf's Den. I have an awesome guest today. Um, very interesting stuff. It is Dr. Kennedy Summers. How are you, Dr. Kennedy Summers? <laughs> I'm good. How about you? So um, I guess let's just like to start right out of the gate. For those of you who are, are watching on YouTube, you'll get it. But those of you who are listening might not get it. So let's just say it. She's not your average doctor, by the way. Like you're also Playboy Playmate of the Year 2014, right? Yes, I am. Not that that's, by the way, I mean, it's, you know, they, they shouldn't, it shouldn't, well, I guess it should be a shock, right? I mean, but not that it's a, I, I want to put a good negative or positive context. It just is, but it's just interesting to me how you go from one thing to the other thing, which came first. You're, um, I think you probably started, you start modeling at a very young age because you're a beautiful girl, right? So woman. So how old were you when you first started modeling? 14. 14. So I started super young. Yeah, I actually, so I skipped my senior year of high school and I went to college really young at 17. And then when I turned 18, I dropped out. I moved to Milan to model and I was like, forget school. I don't care. Like, I just want to travel. So wow, I basically and, made myself a high school dropout for a while there. <laughs> and and what was that like? I, mean, I know it's everyone thinks it's very glamorous. I've married uh, a couple of models throughout the years and non-models too. I've been married a few times, unfortunately, but you know, <laughs> not like a great it. life now. <laughs> but 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 no, but I know it's not a glamorous thing always. It's a real grind, right? It's not easy. It's like, you know, you're living in a, I mean, I guess at what level you go in, but you're in a model's house oftenly. Is it, you know, often and it's just like, it's it's fun, but it's also a grind. It's, there's a lot of ups and downs to it, right? Yeah, I think when you're like a teenager, you're just excited to be in Thailand or excited to be in Korea or, you know, it's just something new. But now obviously it wouldn't be my dream to live in a house with like eight other people. It's too right. much. <laughs> And what's it like in those houses? Is it like a lot of cat fighting? Are they, all the girls getting along? There's a little backstabbing going on. Like, all right, you're going on the same ghost. Let me put some, like, uh, you know, some um, pat powder to give her a rash on her face or something so she can't get the job. Any of that stuff going on or no? Yeah, in Istanbul, they used to steal my clothes so I'd have nothing to wear to castings. But, you know, in other places, I've made a lot of good friends. So it just really depends. But, like, some places are really competitive and you just get stuck with kind of a bad group of girls. And then other places, you're like, I've made friends for life, you know? And did you make a lot of money modeling? Yeah, I was successful. I had a good time. And then my agency at one point was like, hey, you know, you're getting a little too old for the fashion thing. We think that you should get implants and kind of go more commercial. And I think I was 22 or 23 when they said that. And so I got too old. Like, so I know crazy. I was too old. It's time to retire. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, I'm not really like super comfortable with my body now. So I was like, I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to go be a doctor. I'm going to go do some normal stuff. So and wait, then, wait, so they made they asked you to get how big how big of boobs did you get? What size implants? Like small, like two fifty cc's, almost nothing. It was, what was just that, like, like B or B C light small C cup or big B cup. Is yeah. That? Well, on me it looked like a lot worse because I was so thin. It was like five yeah. nine one hundred and ten pounds, so it was not okay. Like, it got was not it, a good look. <laughs> right. So you so so that's interesting. And they asked you to do that for, to be more of like a like a. a um, in like TV commercials or in or in magazines that weren't related to like fashion, more like uh, like uh, advertisements, right? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Catalog, swimwear, kind of like what you see Victoria's Secret or PacSun, like that kind of commercial thing. Not like and runway you, is in. Sure. Were you comfortable with your body before that? Yeah, of course. And it is what after they asked you to get some implants, that was when you became uncomfortable with, with your body and stuff? You felt like it wasn't authentic or what was it? Well, I did it and I was like, Ugh, like I just didn't feel like me for a while. So I was like, I think I'm just done with this. You know, like I don't really have any interest in doing anything else. I wanted to travel and like going back to my country, like going back to the States and just doing catalog work didn't sound like mm -hmm. fun. Like it wasn't really my reason for bottling. Where Where are you from originally, by the way? Where, where are you from? <laughs> That's tough. So I was born in Germany and um, I lived in Asia and the States for a while. My parents- Army brat, sounds like an army brat, huh? long time ago and then obviously when i turned 18 i took off to europe and asia again so i don't really feel home anywhere <laughs> got it all right so the prison and wine company insists on doing things differently like 20 years ago when they decided to combine some of california's best and most unusual grape varieties to make a bold and complex band, AKA their namesake wine, the Prisoner Red Blend. From the shape, the weight of the bottle, which is totally cool, to the label featuring Francisco Goya's artwork, love it. Every detail striking and memorable. The wine, it's rich, smooth, 
totally approachable. And now the Prisoner Wine Company will ship all of their rule bending blends, like the Prisoner Red blend, the Prisoner Chardonnay, and Thormelo, direct to your door. I advise that you take advantage of this. It is totally awesome. And what year was that now? That was, uh, you, so you were in Playboy, I think it was what, so you eventually started, did Playboy, right? What year was 2014? Uh, 2013, it was Miss December, and then 2014, Playmate of the Year. And um, and what year, and, and how old were you back then? Let's get your current age, let's we'll do math here. 26. All right, so you, you did Playmate of the Year 2015, Miss December 2000. No, 2013, Mrs. December, Mrs. December, 2014, Playmate of the Year? Yeah. Okay. And so you're in your, your mid-30s now, right? Early mid-30s? Yeah. Great. So so let me ask you this. It's a really interesting question for me. You don't graduate high school. You did graduate. You have an equivalency originally? Um. So the way that worked was I had to take English and government to meet the state requirements to have the degree, but I never actually got a degree because I went to a private school. And so if I'd been in public school, they would have kind of issued you some kind of equivalence okay. thing. But my school was like, absolutely not. <laughs> so so how do you, you leapfrog from not having a formal high school education to becoming a doctor a, and a medical doctor. I know it's understand you've got an incurious now, but still that's, um, you know, uh, uh, do you plan on practicing in the United States after and taking the test here or, or you already done that? Yeah, I've been, I mean, you go to half the school in the States. So I've been working in the States for a couple of years. Uh, I'm applying to residency here. I've taken a couple of the U.S. exams. So I've got one more and then hopefully I'll be in residency in July. I think that's amazing, by the way. What, what, what was it that made you, what was it inspired you to go from, you know, model and then let, let's take this chronologically. So you stopped modeling in what year? 2000, 2001, something like that. Okay. And then what did you do between 2001 to 2013? <laughs> I was, let's see, I did a couple, a little bit of college. I got, I crammed a whole bunch into like, three semesters and then I well I went to Milan really Germany and like Italy Italy Germany and France for a bit came back for a semester and then moved to South Korea and then I stayed in Asia for like six years and then ended up kind of back in Turkey and then Europe again and then decided that I wanted to go to med school were you where in Asia were you if it's, where, where in Asia were you what country or multiple um, countries Yes, so South Korea, Hong Kong, China, Thailand, Taiwan, um, Malaysia, Singapore. God. Yeah, China, there's a lot. Japan, like everywhere. I've been to all, I've been to all of them myself you know, on speaking tours and stuff. So um, so along those, you know, during that journey, uh, were you married? Do you have a boyfriend, um, a girlfriend? What, what, what were you doing during those years? Um, mostly single. I was briefly married to a guy from medical school, but it didn't work out. So, you know, there's Got something it. they call the playmate curse, which is like, oh, if you're married, when you become a playmate, you won't be by the time your issue comes out. So, <laughs> Really? Yeah, we actually, I left him while I was there shooting my centerfold. <laughs> what happened? What, 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 why, why is that? Why does it, it, um, I mean, I, I don't believe in like it's a mystical curse. There's obviously something that probably happens during during that time. Is it the uh, attention that you suddenly get? It seemed you would have already had that as a model where people, eyes gawking at you and guys coming after you. You're a beautiful woman, obviously. So what was it about the Playmate experience that makes it so toxic to uh, a monogamous relationship or for that matter, a marriage? I think guys are really supportive of like, oh yeah, send nude pics, who cares? You're never going to get it. And then a lot of the girls get it and they're like, oh. Like they didn't think anything would happen. And then when it does, they just weren't prepared for it basically. And so they kind of overcompensate to try to figure out if they themselves are still desirable. It's kind of like a competition. Like she got this attention, like do girls still want me kind of thing. So I think there's a bit of that going on. <laughs> Interesting. So in other words, from the man's position, their wife or girlfriend suddenly is getting all this attention and it makes them feel inferior or less than in some way. And they feel that in order to be equal again or feel good about myself or know that I'm still desirable, I need to seek out 
other women. So the men start to cheat on the woman. Is that what happens? Pretty much. Some it's not the women that get. Others. It's not that the women start cheating on the men because they've gotten the attention. No. Interesting. That's really. That's. I guess that makes no sense. One, yeah. No one at the mansion was sleeping with Huff. You know, he was married. He was well into his late eighties. Like there was nothing going on there that was remotely scandalous. It was. Very I, I recently, I, I recently read an article about that, which really disturbed me. This woman wrote some article. Uh, she was married to him. Was she married to him or was she, she um, I don't know if she was his wife. Maybe she was his wife, but she wrote this article about, and like said that she was disgusted. Like she went there and she knew she was going to sleep with him, but she was just so shocked at like how brazen it was. Like other people will watch. I was like, you know, come on, give me a fucking break. You go to the, like she says, she goes to the mansion with her eyes open. She knows she's going to be different than you. She was going there to sleep with him apparently, right? She says this is the article and she goes, and I just was so felt so violated. I'm like, really? I mean, if, you, if you're kind of going there with the intention of being, you know, in a relationship with the guy sexually, you can't complain. And I, and I knew he was old, and that didn't bother me. But what bothered me was that, like, the way we had sex the first time, we just flung together, and other people were watching. I'm like, what the fuck did you expect? I mean, you're, you know, it's Hugh Hefter for Christ's sake, right? I mean, it shocked me. Wait, wait, let me guess. He wanted something that wasn't like a plain vanilla in the missionary position, right? I mean, it's Hugh fucking Hefner, right? I mean, the guy's a legend, right? But I, I, I think, no, right? It, it kind of disturbed me. Like, I think you're, what you're saying is I like that. You're saying, no, this was just a, nothing scandalous, right? People were there. It's a business, right? Basically. Yeah. It was just chill. You know, it was like you watch a movie, you can go hang out at the pool. If they have dinner, they have drinks. But So if someone got was having sex with Hefna, it's because they wanted to be having. He wasn't pushing himself and every insisting on, I would assume, right? Or no? no, he was married. I had only met him when he was married, so I never. But wasn't he married to three women or something at some at some point? Like, or like you know, he had like a, a three a threesome going on there, like in his own non Mormon way. Maybe like he wasn't really married to one, but you, you know. Yeah, he had a lot of girlfriends. I think he had like seven at one point. It was quite a bit. Did this guy have like a like a lifetime supply of Viagra or something? How did he get it up in his eighties like that? I got it. I don't. Just... Even, I don't know if he did. I have oh, no idea he if he did. Maybe he did. <laughs> He never oh, it was like movies going around. There was a whoosh, whispering around the mansion, like you know, you got to see that it's really shriveled up at this point. It's like it's like some fucked up shit. You know, it looks like a worm. No, no, no one was whispering stuff like that. No, no never. I guess you, we could think, talk about it medically right now. His penis was slightly, um, you know, de engorged and shriveled up into lack of epidermal tissue. No, it wasn't like that. No, definitely not. No. Okay, well, so you actually lived in the mansion? No, I didn't. I oh. just hung out there. So, like, to find... It wasn't the same. Yeah, I, when I was there, it was like he was married. It was a family house again. Like, no one lived there. Got it. But you go there, you have fun. Was he a good host? Yeah, he was, was great. He, he was so kind, yeah. Was he a funny guy? I didn't know him personally. <laughs> he was really deaf, but it was hard. Oh, he was deaf. It was really hard to talk to him because it was like short screaming back and forth. It was brief. Oh my, he didn't have a hearing aid or that even the hearing aid wouldn't work. I don't know if he wore it, but it was like, I would say something that his wife would like, hey. <laughs> yeah. I think though, I mean, honestly, I have to say in Hefta's defense, if I spent my life surrounded by 10 women at once, I would develop deafness on purpose. Like just to like not have to hear it all. Like, I mean, like I remember my father, he was like, he, he passed away at 89 years old, wasn't in great health. But when he was in his like mid seventies, like he's like 78, 79, like my, my, you know, he goes to the doctor, my mother, my mother's like, you need to go to the doctor. You're like, you know, you, you're losing your hearing completely. And they go to the doctor together and, and he takes all these different tests. And after that, that session where he's like hooked up to all the machines, the doctor calls both of them in and goes, well, I have good news and bad, bad news. And she, he's like, she's like, what's the good news? The good news is your husband's hearing is perfect. The bad news, he's learned to fucking not listen to you after all these years. He's selectively tuning you out, right? Aww. So I wonder how much, <laughs> how much of, and I know my mother's the best, but I can understand his pain because my mother can talk, you know? She's the best. I mean, my mother's, my mother's an attorney, by the way. She's a lawyer, went to, went to law school very late in life, in her late sixties. She uh, graduated from law school. Yeah. So she had a big career change at that point. She was a CPA before that. Anyway, getting back to you. So, all right. So you were married once briefly to a guy who you met in medical school. What year did you actually go to medical school? I guess I must have started in 2011 or 2012. It was a long time before. And then 
while I had just finished like the first couple of years and I sent pictures to Playboy and then they took me out. So I took like a five year break in the middle there. If you want to grow your business, you want to diversify your content, this is a product that I 1000% believe in and use myself every day. And it's been a game changer for me, making more money for me than any other app I've used that's even close to this. It's called Melon. And Melon is a web-based live streaming studio that makes streaming easy, and lucrative. It is literally the best out there by a country mile. And I'm looking you in the eye, I'm telling you, that's a fact. Go to live on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube in just five clicks. All of them at once. You're not gonna find a better tool out there than Melon for your live streaming needs. Impossible. Better streaming in HD, recording functionality, real-time audience interaction. You get everything with Melon. So start streaming with Melon today. Go to melonapp.com slash wolf. That's melon, M-E-L-O-N-A-P-P, melonapp.com slash wolf. Sign up for a free account. Because of me, it's free, by the way. You get a high-performance professional live streaming tool for free. It's blazing fast. The response time is like that. Low CPU usage. It's all available right in your browser. Go to melonapp.com slash wolf and start streaming today. This is a no-brainer. You don't try this, honestly, then you must not like making money online. Did they, did like, was it a great, I, I didn't, I don't remember, I didn't, I didn't read Playboy, you know? Um, yeah, I don't, I'm not really into porn. I, I saw my friends, I heard about a place called porn, I've never been on it myself, but I think there's some place called porn, who knows? Anyway, but uh, I'm never, I was never big into Playboy, you know, except when I was very, you see, I think, honestly, that porn, has kind of ruined it in, in a lot of ways. Like modern porn on the internet is like, it's so over the top right now. It's like any perversion, no matter how crazy and insane it is, you can find it with like the press of a couple of keys. Like I want to see midgets and donkeys flying on a magic carpet with the four dildos and a dwarf, female dwarf and a moose. Oh, 84 videos like that. They have every perversion online. When you were younger, a Playboy magazine was like a coveted, this amazing thing. You'd, you'd get one, you'd hide it under your bed and, and you'd see this little bit, there you'd see breasts, but the little bit of, 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 the, of the pussy, but not that much. And it was like unbelievable. Like it was like, it, it was so, it almost was like, I think healthier than it is today where it's almost like it's so over the top now that I think it's very easy to get lost. Not that I have gotten lost in porn, but I think some of my friends maybe have gotten lost in, you know how it is. You know, some of my friends might have gotten lost in pornography, but what are your thoughts on that whole issue of like modern pornography versus the, I, I consider the more staid and healthier version with like Playboy? Yeah, that was actually the reason they tried to go non-nude for a while because they felt they couldn't compete with just how much material is out there. You know, every day it's just new stuff and new stuff. And so like you're seeing nude everywhere, you know, it's not the groundbreaking, you know, social message that it used to be. It's just yeah. like, okay. So they Midget tried to go anime on. for their crazy stuff, right? It's like unbelievable, you know? And it's, you know, it's yeah, interesting. Every time I read an article where it says, you know, where is where is the highest concentration of porn view? Like what part of the United States? Take a guess what areas of the United States, the top two areas have the most porn downloads or, you know, viewing. I would guess like Idaho and Kansas or somewhere in the middle Bing. of nowhere with you're, nothing to do. You know, <laughs> well, it's not that. You know, it's, it's in the Bible Belt. And also in Salt Lake City with the Mormons. Where they, where it's, where, so the more they try to repress you, right? The more people will secretly view it. So it's, it's, it, it, was, it was pretty surprising when I saw these figures. It always comes down to the most conservative areas of all are the ones that are the, are, are the biggest watches of pornography. And I think there's nothing wrong with pornography, by the way. It's natural, but I just think it's almost taken something away now. Forget the unrealistic thing. The, like I, was, Billie Eilish just put, you know, uh, made a big statement that she thought porn like destroyed her. Did you see this article that she, she was uh, interviewed in? No. She said that she was like porn corrupted her life and she started watching porn at the age of 11. And I think that's probably not that surprise. I think a lot of kids start watching it incredibly young, by the way, which is, you know, not a good thing, I would think. And then, um, but she said like, you know, it's thought you get, it's like almost you get like anything else online 
when you start getting into it, you go down this rabbit hole and you start seeing more and more extreme versions of what you're watching. And before you know it, the natural things that once turned you on or once held your interest are nothing. And you, you go to this place and you find yourself in this place where you're watching very extreme stuff. And that also could be not just porn, but it could be political viewpoints where you're suddenly way on the right or way on the left and you're believing in things, whether it's hollow earth theories or flat earth theories or all the conspiracy shit and it's amazing how you see that happen online with social media yeah i mean you definitely see it and i believe you know where i went to med school prostitution was even legal and i have never felt safer in my life walking down the street at 3 a.m i think in these cultures where we're really repressed we do a lot of damage to people because sex is a very normal healthy thing and if you go to europe it's very okay but here we're like Sure, son. Why don't you sit here and watch the video game Slaughter, hear all these dead bodies, but like, oh God, cover your eyes, there's a tit. Couldn't be, I could not agree with you more. I actually wrote a paper. I think it was in seventh grade, believe it or not. Seriously, that, that, like, all, way back when I was very, very young about the difference in TV violence and the impact that it has. And while in Europe, they don't allow TV violence to nearly the level, this is back in the day, I'm sure it's probably different now with cable and stuff, so many channels, right? Everyone needs content. But back then, is they were much more liberal about nudity and normal, healthy things, and they wouldn't show violence on TV. Well, in the United States, you could be killing, slaughtering, chopping people up, and that's okay, but you show even a nipple and you get fined by the Morals Commission at the FT fucking C. It's ridiculous, you know? It really is. Yeah. It's really, really insane, you know? It really is. I think it's just, it's such a strange thing to care about. It's just really got roots in a lot of Puritan stuff that's no longer relevant. Oh, I think it's got, it's, you know, listen, I'm not into the whole thing about the patriarchy and all this shit. My daughter's like really into that. I love my daughter, but she's very into the whole, you know, you know, I'm, I'm a very, you know, um, not feminist, but just a, a much more, you know, that view of the, you know, the patriarchy is devilish. But it's in that sense, yeah, it's like really this, this whole weird thing that like, and of course, all the shit that was going on in the Catholic Church just goes to show you the hypocrisy of it all. But that was sort of what was defining the moral standard of this, you know, uh, you know, good Christian or Protestant values of like, you know, not showing nudity. It's fucking ridiculous. It's, it's utterly ridiculous. And meanwhile, if you go on TV, people are slaughtering each other and and and, and doing st- it's, um, it's really unreal you know it's so it's so so strange you know the games get more and more realistic my brother's playing one of these new ones i don't know what it's called it's on a ps5 and it's kind of like grand theft auto but you're killing people and it's so graphic and it looks so realistic now it's crazy and i'm like but the kids can't watch like if somebody's making out hardcore on the tv <laughs> like that's gotta go <laughs> uh, it's right it, and, and you know and, and it is, and it, it, I think you're right. It goes back to this really, really weird value system from the, almost like roots in Victorian England, and then you know to the early days in the U.S. But some of it is really is may is men. It's almost the equivalent of like what in the Middle East, certain areas where they want women to remain fully clothed because you take away women. So that what? So men are so weak that if they have to see a woman's body exposed, then like, you know, the women will have power. So I don't know what is some of it was rooted in that and taking power away from women by by, you know, trying to not let any of their like, um, you know, sexual energy. And I think by, by female sexual energy is, a, is an amazingly important thing. And I think it's a positive thing. You know, I think they really got that wrong society and, and and Europe was definitely far more places like Amsterdam were really like wide open like that and I think you're right you feel safe walking down the streets to think that you're not going to allow prostitution oh, come on oh so is that that's gonna anything it just creates exploitation of women by when you stop prostitution by making it illegal it women get exploited because it's going to happen anyway so they need protection because they can't go to the law for protection and it creates this whole vicious cycle and the, and the, and the victims are always women themselves it's terrible yeah, I mean, I agree. I Like I said, I'd never felt safer. Like, it could be two in the morning. I could walk down the street with my friends, and I would never even think something would happen. Like, it was just so fine. And then, you know, I come back to the States, and I'm like, oh, I don't want to go outside. It's 8 p.m., but it's dark out, you know? Like, I don't want to take my trash out. <laughs> it feels strange when you walk into a into a, uh, a patient. Have you, have you seen any patients yet? Like, I'd be a little taken aback if you walked in the room and like you're the fucking doc holy shit i'd be like i'd be happy you know like i'd be like oh wow that's my doctor that's great i I think no because i think that beauty is it has power there's energy positive energy to it so like it's here i think it could be healing energy as well like you know like the patient wants to impress 
the doctor, like wants to feel a bond to the doctor. Do you ever feel that at all? Have you seen patients yet at all? Yeah, I've seen a lot of patients. I've been seeing them for a couple of years. Um, the last how do they react when they see patients? So how do they react? Do you, do you notice like, obviously they must react when they see you, right? Hey, nurse. <laughs> That I was, I, I tried to, I, I was going to say that. I said, ah, I'm not going to throw. That was too much of a, that was just a layup. I didn't say, you know, so you, you need a candy striper, right? They think you're the nurse, but seriously, but what are the patients, how do some of the patients like, um, have trouble like humming, a humming, a humming, a doctor. I have a pain, I have a pain, I have a pain in my groin area and my middle upper thigh area is really sore lately. And I need, it's a desperate need of an examination. You ever get that or no? No, I would go get an adult. <laughs> what? No, you know, I said I would go get an adult if that happened. But, you know, for like dermatology, I'd be in there with the male teacher all the time. I cannot tell you how many guys walk in and just go drop their drawers. Like, I got this thing. And, you know, there's a guy in there, too. But it's just like everybody walks in there like, whoosh. Just like, really? Sir, like, hello, hi. How about telling us what's wrong before you just like. They just drop it. Yeah, they're just really comfortable. Like, and it's just derm everywhere else. They're like very modest. <laughs> Interesting. But like to the patients, to like the male pay or the female patients, do they ever like, you know, a little bit like um have trouble managing their 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 feelings, like, you know, the the sexual energy or no, it doesn't happen? No, it's very professional. It's a very normal environment, just like when you go to the doctor. It's not like a love connection, it's not dating, it's just I'm sick, please help, and then you leave. You know, you're there for ten minutes and you go. You mentioned that you were doing a, 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 a business management of physicians. Is that you're going into that area of medicine? What do you, what do you or I, th I thought it was um, you're going into plastic surgery or something like that or dermatology? What is it? Uh, I looked at the cosmetic stuff. So I have a master's in healthcare administration and I'm getting my doctorate in business admin. I actually just started my dissertation this week. So that sucks. <laughs> but yeah, I just thought that I would like to run a practice, run a hospital. I was thinking someday maybe I would open some hospitals. I'm not entirely sure what I want to do with it, but I think that it's been really helpful just kind of developing ideas. Like I do have some thought that I would like to start a homeless charity. And so I would like to kind of know how to run that without sinking myself. Mm hmm. Oh, it's easy. Just gonna get a lot of donations. <laughs> it's always easy when you're getting a lot of donations, right? Well, I want to have like a halfway house kind of. So like not a place to sleep, but like lockers, a place to shower. You can rent clothes, a dry cleaning thing, just so they can kind of get back on their feet and lock things up while they go to work and then take a shower and just kind of get back on their feet, but not. For who? For, for men, women, both? Anybody experiencing homelessness who's just trying to get a job, you know, you can't get a job without an ID. You can't get an ID without a mailing address. So if you can give them just something where they can start getting back on their feet and break that cycle, like I think that could be really helpful. So I'd like yes. to know how to run that as a business. Oh, it's pretty simple, actually. Yeah, it's really not that difficult. But I, I, this, that would be, if you interview me, I, I could tell you how to do that. You, know, you start a, a, you know, a certain type of charity, a 501c3, you raise a little bit of money, you bring in someone that's already done it before you go out, hire someone that has experience in running these type of houses or similar ones, and you start there and you'll be in business just like that, you know? Go into an area that's a high concentration of homeless people, and I, I don't think you'll have any shortage of customers, so to speak, right? And then you can, I think you'd be really great as a figure to be online raising money, you know, through internet marketing campaigns you could raise a ton of money from people both institutionally and lay people it just would you know love the story it's, you're interesting you're you're not the certainly not the average person and that's what people love to sort of they're going to put a little money into a charity you know yeah you know obviously you've done some incredible things at a relatively young age so i think you do really well with it it's not hard to, i would I, what i'm saying is don't overthink it i think what happens with a lot of people in business i can't help but get this what i teach business entrepreneurship right so i think a lot of people get locked up and like this how to how to how to they want to they think they need to understand everything from a to z to start and you don't because you just didn't know like how, you need to start you just need to know how to start and you kind of learn as you go now i don't mean that you just fly and leap without looking it's not what i mean i'm saying no matter how much um how many courses you take how many degrees you get um you'll never know everything about what you're going to do and a lot of it is surrounding yourself with people that have some experience. So you want to like hire those people early on. And, you know, just based on what you've accomplished already, I would, I got to tell you, I could promise you that you're already 
ready to do what you want to do. It wouldn't take much at all. Just a little bit of planning where you kind of, you know, lay out a basic plan of how you'd start your charity, raise a little bit of money, hire someone that's already done something like this and leverage off of their knowledge. And you could probably start it sooner than you think. Yeah, I just, I feel like everyone's got a different process. And for me, I really wanted to learn the how-to. You know, I had some great teachers. I really learned a lot that I had no idea going into. And, you know, like my mom is she's a nurse practitioner. So like, I didn't grow up with people running businesses so much as, mm. and like, I just didn't have the exposure to it. Like most of my family was in stocks and doing kind of trading stuff. And I just, yeah, it just never came up. So I needed to learn and it worked for me, but it's far too late to quit now with just a dissertation left. So. Oh no, I'm not saying that you should stop studying or anything. All I'm saying is that I would just, you know, I wouldn't worry about that when you're ready for it. I'm sure that um, there's, there's a lot less moving parts to this sort of thing that you might think there are. That's all I'm saying, you know? So don't worry about it when you're ready. Go for it. I'm sure you'll be successful. I have no doubt about it. It seems that you're like the type of person, whatever you put your mind to, um, you succeed at. Tell me, is there anything you failed at? Like where you've wanted to do something and and you didn't do it? Like you've had other dreams and aspirations along the way and and you said, no, either not for me or I can't do it? Um, I'm sure I've failed at stuff. Like I'm sure something has happened. You know, I'm sure there were some modeling jobs that I wanted that I didn't get or, you know, just like average things that you see. Because as a model, you know, you get rejected every freaking day. So it's not like. I don't, I, I don't mean that. Yeah, I don't mean that. <laughs> yeah. I'm totally like, like did, you, did you ever want to try to be an actress maybe and then you didn't and you didn't go that route? Because that would seem that many models end up trying to be actresses. But they yeah, have no talent. I thought it'd be fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought it'd be cool, but I did modeling. So I kind of fell into it. My parents put me into like etiquette classes, kind of like a finishing school thing. And the lady just happened to own a modeling agency. So that's how I fell into it. And then when I realized like I could travel, that was what happened. So when I was in my, like starting my, the middle of my second year of college, I was, I'd finished my biology major. I was done. And my school was like, well, you can't just dig off for the next two and a half years. You have to take another major. And I was like, shit, I'm going to get an international studies degree. I'll go to Italy. That'll cover half of it. Then I can be done again. And like, you know, <laughs> classy. But um, my parents said no. And so I was like, well, I really want to go to Italy anyway. So that's how I fell back into modeling. It's just like, well, I've decided I want to go. And so, yeah. So it wasn't like, I want to be an actor. It was like, I just, I want to go to Italy and this worked. And then I just started having fun. And yeah. <laughs> Do you love money? Do you like making lots of money? Is that important to you or no? Uh, I like a certain level of comfort for sure. Um, it's not so much about the money. Like that's not a driver. I just like to be comfortable. I like to have a nice environment to be in. I like it to be quiet and safe and peaceful and otherwise, no, nah, I don't need a lot. What would you say your highest value is for you? Like what, what do you really value most in your life right now? What do you, um, cause like, you know, your values almost are what, what dictate everything else like you have these you know values that lie at the center of everything then you have all these goals that are designed to sort of align with your values and ultimately a vision that where you want to end up but what are those core values what's most important to you i mean determination is huge integrity you know you got to have follow through you have to have discipline like all these things matter a lot and i think consistency is really important you know just getting up and showing up and doing the work even when you don't feel like it so Mm -hmm. all of that does it you know once you start a path and you don't really know what you want to do you just have to stick with it i guess <laughs> one of the things i always say is that you know a lot of success is getting yourself to do the shit you know you have to do even when you don't feel like doing it every single day right a hundred percent easy to do easy to do what you love doing and what yeah, you want to be doing but very often to be successful there's all these other things that you have to do but don't enjoy it many people fall down there and they focus on only the things they like and don't focus on what they need and have to do so so with that question so where do you see yourself in five years from now where do you want to be <laughs> i would like to be done with residency i want my dissertation done um i want to work for a couple of years and then i do see myself going to law school after Oh, wow. So you want to be a doctor? I know people have done that. Doctor, lawyer. Uh, my mother said she was a CPA, then became a lawyer. Good for you. So on some Thanks. level, <laughs> education is obviously self-education, you know, self right? You know, learning more and knowledge, growing your knowledge base is something that obviously is very important to you. Anyway, listen, you're amazing. And uh, I didn't know who you were before this, but I'm a big fan now. Um, and uh, I think that 
my opinion, whatever you are trying to accomplish, you most certainly will. So um, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. And um, I want to have you on again next time with maybe a better internet connection. We can really dig a lot deeper into some of these issues. Yeah, when I get back to the city sometime. <laughs> Perfect, though. All right. Dr. Kennedy Summers, nice to meet you. Nice to Take meet care. you. Take care. Everyone, thanks for listening and check out. Where do they find you, by the way, if they want to find information about your uh, website or anything like that? Miss Kennedy S. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, all of it. Miss Kennedy Summers. Miss Kennedy, M I S S Kennedy Summers. Find her. And she's also beautiful. Take Thank care. You. Another great episode of The Wolf's Den, and we'll see you next week. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye.